ministry of the fullness. We began yesterday trying to understand how to live and maximize all that God has made available to us. And I remember saying, there's a difference between existence and life. The Bible said in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, it said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. And I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. So I said existence is God's authorization over a created being to manifest in a realm. But I also said before you were given that authorization to manifest in that realm, you were a reality in God. And so I said life is connectivity to God and a state of incorruptibility. And so life is not necessarily existence. Because when you were in God, you were not yet given the permission to experience the realms of God. Until you were given access to experience the realms, you are not yet existing. But even as an intangible reality in God, without cognitive capacities, you were. And so that your connection to God in that pure state where you were exactly like God in essence is what you call life. And I said it is because of that that Bible, the Bible describes or defines death not as cessation, but it defines death as separation from God and it also defines death as corruption. So death is not cessation because you always were. Because everything that was created came from within God. And so because you were, you had life, but in an intangible form. But when life became tangible, it became existence. Are we together? And I said the reason it's necessary to explain this is because if you don't understand the laws that govern these two realities, you will never manifest the fullness of God. And so I said, for example, when you come into existence, there are three laws that govern existence. Number one is the authority of God. Number two is the wisdom of God. And number three is the will of God. So if you are not functioning within the context of the authority of God, the wisdom of God and the will of God, even though you are walking in the realm, you are not really existing. That's why the Bible said in 1 Timothy 5, 6, it says, him that liveth for pleasure is dead while he's walking. Because as far as God is concerned, is your operation under his government, by his wisdom, fulfilling his will, that defines your existence. And I said, in addition to that, in order to also give expression to life in its fullness, there are three other laws that also governs life. And I said, the three laws that governs life are the laws of energy, the laws of consciousness, and the laws of light. And I gave some hilarious um, illustrations here. I can say come, and come will mean one thing in English language, but in the language of energy, it can mean a lot of things. Come can mean I'm angry with you. Come can mean you are in trouble. Come can also mean run for your life. You know, I'm seeing some officers here. I think they understand this better than all of us. Because in a civilian context, you can take certain things for granted. But in the military command, is life. There are certain commands that when you hear it, you are in trouble. You know. And why is this important? It's important because the quality of your life is defined by the purity of your energy. If you allow somebody comes into your context and defies your energy, your life will go down. And so if you know that energy governs life, you'll be careful the things that manipulate your energy. The words that you hear the words that you allow to be spoken over you, the things that happen around you, all of these are designed to regulate your energy. And if your energy is corrupt, your life is corrupt. If your energy is wrong, your life is wrong. I keep emphasizing, especially when I'm talking to young people, that life is too spiritual to be taken for granted. Lots of persons open their spirits to secular music and they say they are enjoying it. Just because... There's a demonic intelligence around these songs that makes the reading to 
flow with a particular emotional cord does not mean it's beneficial. There are songs you hear that defies your spirit. You'll just hear these songs and lust overwhelms you. You'll hear these songs and fear hits you. You hear certain songs and you just turn into a violent disposition because they are trafficking energy. The demonic entities understand the wisdom of energy. They know life is regulated by energy. Everywhere you look, rays are being transmitted in form of pictures and in form of sound. The idea is to get in touch with your energy. They don't need to necessarily lay hold on, on you. But if they are able to touch your energy, they will violate you. And a man can be more corrupt just by the things he hears and sees than what he does. Because of the energy traffic. Life is governed by energy. And life is also governed by consciousness. What you are aware of is what determines your manifestation. You can be born again. And I'm so blessed by, you know, the words that we heard and recited this morning to charge our spirits. It, it goes much more than just saying some good or quoting some good scriptures or professing certain things. These words redefine our consciousness. As you say it, after a while you see it. And as you see it, it becomes your reality. That's how you build consciousness. You build consciousness with words. Because as you are saying it, you are creating another world. Some persons may, may have come in here down this morning, but after that word, after that continual energetic recitation, you will discover that you are lifted. And you are not just lifted, but something shifted. And you began to see from another paradigm. And because you started seeing from that paradigm, it will affect your day. Whether you like it or not, you have, you have recreated your day. Because your consciousness will be built into your experience. And then finally, we spoke about light. The kind of understanding you have and the kind of understanding you work with. And I said the reason this is important is because you can have all of God, but you may not manifest God. And so when we are discussing the fullness, we are not just talking about being in possession of God. We are actually talking about the extent to which you are able to manifest God. And what God has in mind is for every one of us to manifest him in fullness, in totality. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, he said you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood is a God's own special people called forth to showcase, to manifest, to unveil, to unravel the excellencies of God. So everything that makes God, God should be on display when you collide with us. We are supposed to be theaters that reveal the glory of God. And until we come to that point, we've not really begun to live. But you see, it's not without a dynamic. It's not without a protocol. It's always been God's plan, but there is something we must do in order to work it out. You know, when God created Adam, he wanted Adam to be the reflection of God to creation. That's why he said in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. On the strength of this order of creation, he said, let them have dominion. That means the earth will submit to them if they are able to reflect our image and our likeness. But if they fail to reflect our image and our likeness, the earth will rebel against them. So the authority the man had was tied to his ability to image God. It was tied to his ability to reflect God. And so existence in itself will therefore be defined by your capacity to reflect God. If you are unable to mirror God, you are just there. You are not really existing. Your life is an impression. You can't make real impact. And so, this conference was put together to help every one of us stop being Christians but becoming reflectors of Christ. Because we've made the idea of Christianity too religious. That people are no longer mirroring Jesus. When you see people, what should fascinate you should be the dimension of God they command. I should know that if I shake a brother, favor is on my life. And so every time I sense a depletion in favor, I start looking for that brother. Because we are not members of a church. We are legislators of dimensions. This is an assembly. That's why it's called the ecclesia. We are legislators 
and representations of dimensions in God. So when we come together, our gathering become a, co a collocation of, of dimensions. So this will be choked. This realm, this atmosphere is choked with glory because everyone came with a dimension. Somebody came with power. Somebody came with favor. Somebody came with love. Somebody came with mercy. Now, when we begin to worship, worship becomes a technology of harmonizing. So love, power, honor, wisdom harmonizes in the atmosphere. So you who didn't have power, you will now fuse into it. That's why I said, behold, how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in harmony. It's like the dew upon Mount Hermon. It's like the oil flowing from the head of Aaron through his beard down to his skirt. Our experiences become one. The person at the level of the skirt, we experience what the person at the head is experiencing because harmony has taken place. And so when we go out, we become custodians of the fullness of God. And so everybody must contend to manifest God. We must fight. We must press for it. Because if we are not manifesting God, we are losing out. And I told us something yesterday. I say when time stops, the measure of God you are able to host and manifest will be your eternal state. That's what time is for. Time is actually to afford you the opportunity to migrate into glory. From mortification to transformation to transfiguration. And so the state you attain in transfiguration will be your eternal state. And so everyone must contend to host and manifest God. Before I go into the teaching this morning, let me explain two things that God made us into for us to reveal to our world. In Matthew chapter this is not in my script. I hope it won't take my time. Matthew 16. Ah, ah, Elohim. Elohim Adonai. Elohim Adonai. In Matthew 16, if you study from verse 13 down, Jesus was asking a question. He said, who do men say, I the son of man, I am? Because the, the Sanhedrin of the then world felt the excellency of life was about their comprehension of the Torah. They thought it was about knowing the Torah, reciting the Torah. And using the Torah to victimize people. They were pornized the Torah. <laughs> they didn't resemble God at all. In fact, Jesus addressed them in Matthew 8, 44. He said, you have your father, the devil. But they were so proud about mental knowledge. They carried the Torah and ah, it was a strange word. And so Jesus was asking the question, hoping that these people that claim they know so much, will be able to as much as discern him. And the disciples, who were their, their faithful students for many years before Jesus came, began to assemble their conclusions about Jesus. And they say, some say you are Elias. Others say you are Jeremiah. Others say you are John the Baptist, returned from the grave. And Jesus was shocked that the whole generation didn't know him. Meanwhile, this Jesus that is asking this question after over 30 years of being born was known by a widow before he was born. A widow who didn't have title in church knew this Jesus on the eighth day of his birth and discerned him correctly as Messiah. 30 years later, the doctors of the law still have not discerned him. Now, if you enter reality, which of the two is more ranking? Among men, the Sanhedrin were called doctors of the law. But in the spirit, the widow is actually the doctor of the law. Because the widow had understanding from reality. She saw him and knew this is the Messiah. But the doctors of the law didn't know. Meanwhile, they were using their brain. 
Because when they say you are a liar, they saw the power that he displayed. And in the Jewish history, nobody manifested power like Moses and Elias. So they said because of this kind of power, this must be Elijah. Because the Bible captures that Elijah will return. Others said he was Jeremiah because his words were piercing. If you heard him, it caught your heart. And Jeremiah was the wailing prophet. So they say, perhaps this is Jeremiah. And others said, you are John the Baptist, return from the grave. Because of the extraordinary things he was doing, they were in their brain. Jesus now turned to his disciples and said, who do you say? I, the son of man, I am. You know, when you are in class, you will be loud. <laughs> when we were growing up in school, when the teacher now looks in your direction, you become very careful. So they don't ask you any question. <laughs> because when they ask the whole class, everybody can say, mama, mama, mama. <laughs> What is this? Mama, mama. They now say, You. <laughs> they say, Who do you say? I, the son of man, I am. And Peter said, You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus told him, This answer is not in the dwelling of mortals. What happened to you is that you came out of flesh. He said, my father which is in heaven has revealed this answer to you. And Jesus said something very instructive. He said, upon this revelation, I will build my church. That means if Peter did not have access to the realm of God, the church would not have been built. Because the church is not just an organized institution. It's an organism. Its life flows from the realm of God. But that's not my emphasis. My emphasis is the answer that Peter gave. has come because God has sent the errand runner from the spirit realm to the earth realm. Because the word Christ in the Hebrew is the word Hamashiach. Hamashiach is the Messiah, the one to come with the message of salvation. So that's the first thing Peter said. But that's not a major revelation. The major revelation is the fact that Hamashiach represents something to the humankind. And that's why Jesus said they will build on the revelation. Because every time Hamashiach is invoked, humanity is upgraded. If you study the Old Testament, every time that word is used, a prophet is about to be anointed. A priest is about to be anointed and a king is about to be anointed. And so when Peter said you are the Christ, the first thing Peter said was that the errand of salvation has come to humankind. But over and above that, Peter was also defining what man will become eventually. Man will become a priest, a prophet, and a king. As a prophet, it means you now have access to the voice of God. Because before this time, for you to be able to hear the voice of God, you must be anointed. You must be mashiach for the voice of God to come to you. So what Peter is now saying is that the voice of God will no longer be resident with a few people. The voice of God now will become the heritage of a body of people. So every one of us who receives Christ has been mashiach into the voice of God. So when a prophet speaks to you now, he's coming to confirm what you know because now you have the spirit of prophecy. That means it will become impossible for you to be confused. There is a discernment that will be built into your spirit man because you have been mashiach So everybody walking now is walking with a form of illumination that is beyond the natural world. On the strength of that, he will live above the corruption, the deception, and the confusion that is in the world. So Peter was speaking about the emergence of an upgraded humanity. And that humanity is the Christians, those who believe in the name of the Lord. Because now the voice of God is with them. The second thing Peter said was that you are now raising priests. And you know in the Old Testament, only the high priest had access to God's presence. 
you couldn't come into God's presence. In fact, the high priest will have to come once in a year to stand before God's presence. And when the high priest stands there, he's carrying out two major businesses. Number one is atonement, to cleanse the people of iniquity. And number two is legislation, to secure their destiny for another one year. So when Peter said you are the Christ, what Peter was saying is that the presence of God will no longer be hid behind closed doors. Everybody now will live from the presence. So we now have the right to appear before God. And as we appear before God, we are able to carry God into our world. And so when you come into the world, your glory is no longer the garment you are wearing. Your glory is no longer the car you came out from. Your glory now is that because you have been mashiach you carry God's presence like a canopy everywhere you are going to. So what happened to the children of Israel when they were walking from, from, from Egypt to the promised land becomes the reality of everybody. We now carry the, the, the presence of God as a defense everywhere we go to. We carry the presence of God as an umbrella. If you are conscious of it, then you know that you are under a cloud all the time. And so the people you call believers are strange people. They have the voice of God, which is a weapon. And they have the presence of God. But over and above that, when he said Mashiach, he also said, we have become a race of kings. That means there's no slave among us. And the Bible said, where the word of the king is, there's power. He said, who can say unto him, what doest thou? What it goes to mean now is that you won't beg your life. You won't beg your way through life anymore. You will command your way through life. Because everything you say is what God will do. And this is why this confession this morning was so important. Because what you are actually doing is not reciting scripture. You are actually commanding your possibility. Because when you become a king, your walls carry power. And so, instead of fidgeting over life, when the challenges of life come against you, you can now stand up boldly and say, in the name of Jesus, I command you, go. I command this, happen. I command that, happen. Because on the strength of that revelation, every one of us is now Mashiach. So every one of us is prophetic. Every one of us is a priest. And every one of us is a king. Because we are prophetic, we have the voice of God. Because we are priest, the presence of God is our inheritance. And because we are kings, we have authority to bring this world under the feet of God's cross. It's, a, it's an upgraded realm of existence. So the first thing that Jesus made available to us on account of his emergence in the gospel and in salvation is that he made us upgraded species. And he didn't stop there. Paul now went further to buttress on the fact in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from verse 45 to verse 49. And this is what Paul said. Paul began to give a contrast between the first Adam and the last Adam. Because when we were physically created, we were created in the order of the first Adam. But this new species is created after another Adam. And in order to help you understand who you now are. Because the reason we are doing all this build up is to show you why you are supposed to manifest God. That means manifesting God is not something you are hoping you will do. It is your birthright. That's why I'm saying this. Manifesting God should be your default state of existence. Because of what has happened. It is on the strength of these things that have happened that you will now apply this spiritual protocol and it will work. If a baboon learns these things I'm teaching, there's no way it can manifest. <laughs> because it's not given to it. I'm just showing us the legalities. And so Paul was speaking. He said the first Adam was of the earth. And so he is earthy. He said the second Adam is the Lord from heaven. That means the first Adam was created as a messenger of God. That's the first Adam. He's of the earth. So he represents one of God's constituencies, which is the earth realm. He said, but the second Adam was not just earthy. He said, he's Lord. He came from heaven. That means our first order, even if we had not fallen, we would have been earthy. No matter how glorious we are, we would have been earthy. He said, but this second order, didn't just come from heaven, but he came as Lord. 
So what it means now is that every one of us in Christ is a heavenly being. And because we come from above, it is natural for us to rule over the earth. Because conferred upon us is the DNA of lordship. He now went further to say, the first Adam was a living soul. He said, but the second Adam is a quickening spirit, a life-giving spirit. What it means is that the first Adam will be impregnable to the afflictions of life. But the second Adam is not only impregnable to the afflictions of life. The second Adam has the power to correct the afflictions of life and he has the power to restore anything existing that is dead. So why the first Adam should not fall sick? The second Adam is not talking about not falling sick. The second Adam gives health. Why the first Adam should not die? The second Adam is not talking about living. The second Adam can give life. So if, you, if something dies, the second Adam has the power to resurrect that thing. Why the first Adam is thinking of succeeding? The second Adam or the last Adam does not succeed. The word is actually last Adam because no other Adam is coming. <laughs> the last Adam does not succeed. The last Adam is success. So he is not improving. He is improvement. Anything he does prospers. Anything he touches prospers. Now the problem with believers is because they've not been taught they now allow circumstances of life dictate what happens to them. And then they also make the mistake of comparing their experiences with those around them. And so the guy is working in an office. And because the unbeliever is crying that they've not paid salary, things are difficult. The believer also joins the unbeliever and says, no, be smarting. Things are difficult. <laughs> so he allows the unbeliever's experience begin to dictate his own experience. Instead of changing things there and say, my success, my sustenance, my preservation is not tied to this office. I'm a messenger here. I'm representing the kingdom of God here. But I survive by my connection to heaven. And if you think it's psyching, go and check your monthly expenditure and compare it with your salary. You will discover that you spend at least three times more than what you earn. Because it's not your earnings that sustain you. Now, if you become aware of this reality, then you now begin to enforce it. So when we are talking about the fullness, it's actually your ability to make what you already have a reality by enforcing it. That's why I told you the subject of the fullness is not necessarily about what you have. Because every one of us sitting here is a priest. Is a prophet and is a king. Every one of us sitting here is of the order of the last Adam. Of heaven and a quickening spirit. But our experiences are not the same. And our experiences are not the same because our manifestation quotients are different. And so the idea behind the teaching is to help us know how to carry what we have and bring it into bear. So that it becomes our reality. And I said, in order to do that, there are three laws that operate it. And I said, the first is the law of the spirit of life. So what God does in order to help you manifest this all-inclusive and all-encompassing second Adam order reality is to come under the government of life. And I said, when you come under the government of life, the government of life operates in an intrinsic form. What it means is that it is not something external. It is within you manipulating and regulating you from within. And I said the way it does or it happens is through impressions. It's through promptings. It's through knowings. And so suddenly from within you, there is a new power that begins to force your way in a certain direction. And as you begin to align with those promptings, you will discover that abilities you were not aware of will begin to manifest. You will suddenly discover that possibilities you were not aware of will begin to manifest because what Jesus did for you through the Holy Spirit is to install these things on your inside. What you will now do in your cooperation with the Holy Spirit and the world is to bring those installations out 
And the way you bring those installations out is first of all, aligning with the law of life. And as you begin to yield to the law of life, you will discover that your propensities will gradually become like the propensities of God. And I said when you migrate into the realm of the law of life, in addition to those promptings, the law of life will mortify your flesh. Because your flesh is your greatest enemy. Your greatest enemy is not the devil. Because in Christ, you are more than a conqueror. Your greatest enemy is not the world. The flesh is your connection to the devil and the world. If you are able to mortify the flesh, the devil will become handicapped as far as your life is concerned. If you are able to mortify the flesh by the spirit, you will discover that the world will be crucified to you and you will be crucified to the world. And immediately, God will evolve out of your spirit and begin to manifest massively through you. I'm not going to overflog this because we've touched it. And then I said the second law that quickens God out of your spirit is the law of light. Because the moment light begins to come to you, God begins to flow out of you. If a man lacks light, he will lack manifestation. Every manifestation we carry is operated by light. In Ephesians chapter 1, from verse 17, it says he prays that the God... God will grant unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of our understanding being enlightened that number one, we may know the hope of our calling. Number two, that we may know the exceeding riches of the glory that is available to the saints. And number three, that we may know the exceeding greatness of his power. That means there is a hope, there is a riches, and there is a power available to the believer, but it will take light to access it. And so the second thing that helps you manifest God's fullness is the level of light that is available to you. If you don't have light, you can't manifest God. God designed it in such a way that his manifestation is tied to your illumination. Without illumination, God will be far from your quarters. And I said the three basic ways of accessing light is number one, through meditation and contemplation. The word meditation is the word hagar. It means to speak forth the word. And the word contemplation is a word for picturing, viewing. And so what you do in order to tap into light is to keep the word before you always. As you are seeing it, reading it, and talking it, after a while, the word will now build a reality around you. That reality is what will help you see through darkness. And so even when darkness brings sickness, the world would have painted too much health for you to be able to see the sickness. When, when darkness paints poverty around you, the world would have painted too much prosperity for you to see the poverty. When darkness paints fear around you, the world would have painted too much faith for you to see fear. So you will discover that spontaneously you will begin to speak what the word has revealed to you. And as you speak it, the reality that comes from the word will subdue the reality that darkness has painted. And so a man who walks in light is a man who gives himself continually to meditation and contemplation. I said the second way to access light is by praying. And I told us yesterday, prayer is beyond God, give me food. God, give me a job. God, give me a breakthrough. Those who operate in the fullness don't ask for jobs. Those are byproducts. Those who operate in the fullness don't ask for food. Those are byproducts. Because when you enter the fullness, you will discover that the fullness has the power to engender those things. There's a level of favor that you can create out of prayer that jobs will be seeking you. There's a level of favor you can produce out of prayer that prosperity will literally navigate in your direction. Literally. You will be shocked the level of dominion you will exact on this world. And so when a man really understands how these things work, he will stop distracting himself with the small things. And so I can't kneel down for four hours asking God for a job. I rather press into God because when I enter into God, there's a realm I will stand and I can command the job. If I enter into God, there's a realm I can stand and I can command protection. If I enter into God, there's a realm I can stand and I can command abundance. And so instead of distracting myself from ascending that realm, I will cut off everything and press. So when we pray, Paul was telling us that prayer brings us 
into spiritual understanding. That spiritual understanding confers upon us the power to engender the things that others seek. That's why Jesus teaching, he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he said, all these things that the Gentiles seek shall be added unto you. Because there's a realm you get to. Everything is an addition. And this addition does not mean you should be idle. It means what you are doing, you do it with superior wisdom. It means what you are doing, you do it with superior ability. So that every other thing will naturally gravitate in your direction. And I said the third way to access light is through purity. A man who walks in iniquity cannot walk in light. The Bible said in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 that they proposed in their heart that they will not defy themselves with the king's meat. And in Daniel 1 20, he said they were 10 times better than their peers. The Bible said, Joseph said in Genesis 39 verse 9, he will not do this wicked thing against God. And in Genesis 41, suddenly, Joseph became the interpreter of the vision of the king. And in addition to the interpretation, he gave him wise counsel. It was on the strength of that wise counsel that the king made him lord. Not on the strength of the interpretation. When he finished interpreting the dream, the king said, well done. But when he told the king, get a wise man and began to produce wisdom. On the strength of that wisdom, the king made him lord of his substance. That level of wisdom and light comes only to those who are pure. Because if you don't sustain purity, you can't walk with light. In Matthew 5, 8, it said, they that are pure in heart, they are the ones that see God. And God is light. You can't see light. You can't interact with light except as purity becomes your greatest pursuit. Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look upon the virgins. And suddenly, in Job 29 verse 4, it says, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secrets of God was upon my tabernacle. He said, by light, I walk through darkness. So men who carry light are men of purity. So the first thing that engenders a manifestation of the fullness is the law of life. The second thing that engenders a manifestation of the fullness is the law of light. And then the third thing that makes for the manifestation of the fullness is the presence of God. These are the things I dealt with in my last two sessions. And so in the next 15 minutes, I want to talk about the presence of God. I try to do recaps So the message can be cognitive. You know, there are too many theologians. They will stumble on your clip and say, what are they saying? They don't even know what they are. Because when you say some things that they don't, they can't interact with, they feel that's error. So you have to pay the price to recap. You have to pay the price. Somebody heard one of my messages and he heard me say, God is not in heaven. Ah! He said, look at them. They are the ones. I told them, if God is in heaven, if all of God is in heaven, then where was God before heaven was created? Where was he? That means heaven is superior to God. Heaven is older than God. Because God was in God before God started creation. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4 verse 10. The Bible said Jesus ascended high above all heavens. What we know is what is available to us. There is much more that we don't know. And we will be proud to think we know so much. His ways are past finding out. So you have to labor to explain. Now, there are two things I want to share about the presence this morning very quickly as we proceed. Number one, are seven benefits of the presence. So a man who begins to manifest God by the technology of the presence will know what to watch out for. The presence of God is not a feeling. 
Many assume the presence of God to be the feeling of goosebumps. So when they have those feelings, they say they are in God's presence. No, that's not the presence of God. The presence of God can make you feel that way. But it's not only the presence of God that makes you feel that way. There are many other things that can make you feel that way. And so if that is what you use as a parameter to judge God's presence, huh, the devil can create a presence for you. <laughs> the presence of God is also different from being in the spirit. What does it mean to be in the spirit? You are in the spirit if the Holy Ghost is in you. That's what Paul taught us. Because Jesus said, it shall be in you and with you forever. Because if it's in you, he's with you. And so Romans 8, 9, Paul said something. He said, can we project the scripture? He said, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So Paul is saying, if the Holy Ghost dwells in you, you are in the spirit. When you are worshiping God, you may become more sensitive of that reality. But it doesn't mean it's when your sensitivity was heightened that you were in the spirit. You were in the spirit because the governor of the realm dwells in you and his atmosphere is there. What therefore is the presence of God? The presence of God in scripture, theologically speaking now, is God's face. When you start studying the glory of God, the glory of God has many compartments. The hand of God, for example, is his power. So when the power of God is moving, what you are seeing is actually the hand of God. You know, God created man like this, not because he, just, he wanted to be creative. He created us like, he assembled us like this to help us understand his glory. But God is bigger than like this. When you say the hand of God, it's not this. The hand of God is the power of God. When the power of God is moving, that is his hand. Exodus 3.20, I will stretch forth my hands and I will strike Egypt with all my signs and my wonders. So every time the hand of God is in act, the hand of God is the power of God. For example, the feet of God is not this. The feet of God is his reign. He said he will put everything under his feet. So everywhere you come and God is dominating fully, what you are seeing is the feet of God. That's why the earth will be his first too. And the way to happen is that the government of this world will become the government of our God and of his Christ. Then you will see the feet of God. The hair of God is his Purity and agelessness. And so every time he's called ancient of days, you will hear, and his hair was white as wool. The eyes of God are his judgments. He said his eye is like torch. It is that eye he will use to look upon you on the last day. So when he see you on the last day, it's not to identify you, it's to judge you. <laughs> so you will pass and God will turn. The thoughts that come will burn your works. If it is not done in purity, it will be burnt off. He said, but in, by, by reason of salvation, you will be saved, but you will lose your works. But the instrument with which he does that are the touches that comes out of his eye. They are raised. They are like radiation. They will pierce into your motive and judge why you did what you did. And on the strength of that, either preserve your work or burn it to ashes. So the judgments of God are his eyes. God doesn't need eyes to see. <laughs> so God is multifaceted. Now the face of God is his presence. And the face of God is his government. And so when we are talking about the presence of God, we are referring to God's government. A man comes into God's presence when God begins to rule over him. The proof that you are in God's presence is that your will will be submitted to his will. If you like, be crying and be under the anointing, rolling and weeping. If your will has not been submitted, you are not yet in God's presence. 
The moment you step into God's presence, you begin to interact with his government. His government will begin to rule over you. That's why the presence of God transforms. The idea behind the presence of God is to cause you to align with him. Transformation is possible only in God's presence because that's where his government dwells. You cannot be in his presence until you are in alignment. The moment Adam rebelled against him, the Bible said God drove him out of his presence. Because what keeps you in God's presence is your alignment with God's will. This is why a man who lives in God's presence is a man who progressively walks in transformation. The presence will keep showing you the things that are not in alignment. And the power that comes with that presence will help you to align. And so the presence is not when you are having goosebumps. Because you can be having goosebumps and be planning to steal the phone. <laughs> you can be having goosebumps and be insisting that you will keep cohabiting with somebody. You are living in immorality and you are having goosebumps. You now fall down. You are weeping. You are weeping. We will help you to the front so that <laughs> people will not step on you. But the presence is deeper than, than that feeling. It's deep, it's deep. The sign is that your will will bend. And like Jesus, you will say, not my will, but thine. That's the sign that you are in God's presence. And so there are, se there are seven things that happens in God's presence. Number one is refreshing. The reason is because sin is a yoke. Sin is a burden. And so when God is able to break you and that sin is lifted, there is a refreshing you will suddenly have when the yoke of sin is lifted. That's why Acts chapter 3 verse 19, it says times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Father. But this kind of refreshing is not a refreshing you have because you are sitting by a blue beach. This is a refreshing that comes when the presence exacts government over you and you repent. That's why I say repent and be converted when times of refreshing comes from the presence of God. There are many people who will never sense that refreshing because the moment you are under the guilt of sin is a yoke. There is a ventilation you feel when the yoke of sin is lifted because your will has been doctored. That refreshing is the proof that you are under God's presence. It's called the refreshing of the Holy Ghost. But it comes when you are converted. The second thing that happens in God's presence is rest. And rest is not relaxation. Rest is actually a state of dominion. A man who walks in rest, he has power to exercise control. He can cause everything around him to align with what God said. You have rest in business when you exercise dominion in business and things are working as they should. You have rest in your health when you walk in divine health. You feel a pain, you say, go back to order. You see a growth, you say, vanish. You feel a, 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 a breakage, you say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. The moment you can exercise dominion, you have come into rest. That's what rest means in the spirit. It's dominion. But that dominion is the presence that imparts it. It's not by shouting. Many people think authority is shouting. You will shout and the demon will slap you. They came and it's not one. Seven of them. And said, in the name of Jesus, they called the right name. And they called it at the right intensity. And in case you don't know the one we are saying, it's the same one that Paul preaches. And the demons looked at them and slapped them. Some years ago, we went to cast out devils. <laughs> a brother who was living in immorality. You know, there are different kinds of demons. <laughs> there are demons that are servants that possess people. There are others that are fallen angels. They are principalities. Those ones don't possess people. They, they control people. Those ones, they rule people. They rule territories. The reason is because spirits are in different glories. If you study Colossians 1, 15 and 16, you will see it. That when you come to the realm of God, the most ranking beings are called thrones. 
The next ones are called dominions. The next ones are called principalities. Then you have powers. Then you have messengers. Now, when Lucifer was a dominion, the same way man was a dominion, because it was the same authority we exercised. A, a throne, a throne is actually no longer participating in running God's errand. A throne is actually a prince that God brings to co-rule with him. So his job is to sit with God in the seat of government. They are the ones they call elders. That's why when you go to heaven, he said he saw 24 thrones. Sitting on them were 24 elders. Their job is just to rule with God. They have secrets. And so when God wants to do something, they are the ones that deliver the secrets of God. John said he went to heaven and a strong angel said there's no hope for humankind. And an elder said, told him, weep not. He said, behold, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David had prevailed. That's a throne. He has secrets. His job is just to stay with God, worship him. Some of the things they do is to eulogize him. You know, you can't be around a king until you have the power of utterance. You know what to say to him. That's why they will fall on their faces. They will cast their crown and they will say, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. All things were created for thy pleasure. They have the secrets of God. So they know how to, to woo God. It is those worship, they worship God that draws God out of the secret place. So their job is coherent with God. They can woo God. Even when God hides. You know the Bible says God hides in the deep darkness. But when they pour eulogies on God. After a while God will come out. And the heaven will quake. The heavens. They, that's their job. They are called thrones. If you look at the courts of God. There is a gate that is always locked. It's called the east gate. The east gate is where the presence of God comes out from. Because God hides himself. If God allows his fullness, everything will melt. So many times God hides himself. When God is coming into the courts, he comes through the east gate. That's why even the temple that they built in the Old Testament, the east gate is always locked. As a sign that the presence of God is kept. But thrones, they interact in the presence. Now when you leave thrones, you now come to dominions. Dominions are princes that God assigns territories to. That's why when he created man, he said, let man have dominion. And he now said, he, took, he gave the earth to, to man. He said, the heavens belong to God, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. So a dominion is a prince with a jurisdiction. A prince that has authority to rule over a territory. A principality who is next to a dominion is a prince that doesn't have a territory. That's why they send them first. So their job is they are colonizers. In the spirit realm, the ecclesia are the principalities. The ecclesia is the delegation of people they send to take territory, to culture a territory, and to seize a territory on for a dominion. So man was created as a dominion, and that's the order Lucifer also occupied. In fact, the first earth, Lucifer was the governor of the first earth. He said, Thou that weakens the earth, and the kings of the nations looked upon you in bewilderment. Now, when these beings fell, Two things happened to them because they lost glory. And you know, when you lose glory, two things will happen to you. If you are an authority in the realm of God, you will become naked. So when Adam fell from glory, he became naked. But if you are not high in the cadres of heaven, if you are just a messenger, you will become disembodied. So there are two kinds of demons. There are those who are disembodied and there are those who are naked. A principality is not a demon. It's a, it's a naked prince. As a sign that is walking in shame. A demon is a disembodied being. A demon possesses men. So when you show up, you cast out devils. But when you meet a prince, he, doesn't, he has body. He doesn't need to possess bodies. What he's looking for is the authority of a man. So he wants to take that man's authority and begin to function with that man's authority. Now, when you meet a man who is possessed, you need to know if it's a demon or a principality. Okay, I will stop there. 
This one, when you go into the field, you understand it. That's why all of us here can cast out demons, but not all of us can cleanse a madman. A madman is not possessed of demons. A madman is called a lunatic. The prince who is ruling him is manipulating the power of the moon to control him. That one has wisdom and authority. Hope you know when Jesus was fasting, the Bible said the prince of this world came to him. He said, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. That's what Paul said than powers. So there are certain spirits you come to, you have to be pure. You don't just speak in tongues with fornication and come and say, get out. You'll be shocked. <laughs> you come and say, no. Ah, in the name of Jesus. And you are fornicating. <laughs> Sometimes the first thing the spirit will do, he will laugh. He <laughs> will now ask you, who is Sarah? Who is Sarah? <laughs> you know, when we are teaching truth, because we teach faith, we don't teach dynamics. And then you have thieves trying to do spiritual business. Who is Sarah? You will now discover you will step back and say this demon is a stubborn demon. It's not a stubborn demon. You are supposed to have authority over demons and principalities. But the authority you have over demons is tied to your birth in Christ. The authority you have over principalities is tied to your purity. If they come to you and they find something, you can't dislodge them. We went to deal with a demon and the brother who was bigger than all of us. He's a lady, so he felt maybe, since he's a lady, his size will intimidate her. He now came out and said, get out! Before we knew, he grabbed the lady. When the lady slapped this brother, <laughs> my God. <laughs> he slapped this brother. The brother staggered. He couldn't gain himself for a while. When he gathered himself, he came back and slapped the lady. <laughs> that was when we knew that this carnality has gone beyond it. We had to counsel him to step back for a second. Oh! <laughs> now, listen. This is not to put fear in your heart when you deal with demons. You have authority over demons, but make sure your revelation of your new birth is intact and also make sure your lifestyle is intact. Because it's when your obedience is complete that you avenge other disobedience. Sometimes we teach deliverance only from the plane of new creation reality and our new birth. And we don't teach warfare that also has to do with holy living and purity. He said, who can stand in God's presence? Who shall ascend the mountains of God? Who shall stand upon his holy hills? He said, him that is with a clean hand, a pure heart, who have not lifted, lifted up his soul in vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. So there's a requirement of purity and holy living as well. So you don't come back and say, ah, this thing pastor taught, why is it not working? We are teaching the full counsel of God. You need the revelation of the new birth and you also need holy living. Because spirits are not the same. Hallelujah. So the second thing the presence confers is rest. And rest is dominion. When a man is under the presence of God, he has dominion. The third thing the presence confer. Okay, let me just give you a scripture. Exodus 33 verse 14. It said to him, my presence shall go with thee and I shall give thee rest. So when a man is operating under the presence, he has rest. Nothing overwhelms him. He takes charge of all things. Number three, the presence brings glory and honor. When you find a man who walks in the presence of God, there is, there is an envelope around him. You won't know why he commands so much honor. You will find people almost trying to serve him to a point of almost worshipping him because of what rubs off on him. When John went to heaven and he was carried on a guided tour through heaven, in Revelation 19 from verse 10 and 11, he wanted to worship the being. And the man said, no, worship me not. He said, I'm one of your brethren. He is operating at a height in the presence of God. So the presence of God puts honor on men. 
If believers truly submit to God's presence and allow the presence of God sufficiently on them, the honor we will have will be so much that the people of the world will tremble at us. Because the rub off will be so palpable that when you show up, they will literally be interacting with God. In 1 Chronicles 16 verse 27, it says, Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. A man who walks in his presence interacts continually with glory and honor. So when God is trying to break your will, he's not trying to make you weak. He's actually trying to give you an advantage that is beyond the realm of men. He's bringing you into his class. So you operate at his, at his height. There are many people who walk under tyrannical bosses and they just go to the place of prayer. And when they submit to God, as they come back with the presence, the moment they meet that boss, that same boss that wants to kill them, the boss will readjust himself because they came with another layer. They will know. If, even both you and the boss will know what is happening here is not normal. The boss will know, ah, how are you doing? Suddenly they will be polite. The things that they've been resisting you for, they will just submit to you immediately. Because if you carry God's presence, men will submit to you. Because the presence brings honor. The fourth thing the presence gives you is protection. You know that when the children of Israel left Egypt, they walked through many lands, many territories that wanted them destroyed. But because of what they carried, no nation could resist them. In fact, their fame went abroad that if they pass through your city, they will lick it up. So when they were coming towards your direction, you trembled. Because the presence confers protection. In Psalm 9 verse 3, it says, When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. In Psalm 68 verse 2, it said, The wicked shall perish. At thy presence. In Isaiah 63 verse 9. He said in all their afflictions. He was afflicted. And he said the angel of God's presence. Walked with them and saved them. And so when you find a man. Supernaturally protected. In a way that himself cannot explain. There is a technology at work. It's called the presence of God. And trust me. You need the presence of God every day. This world is a wicked world. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, the Bible called this word an evil age. They are inventing evil every day. If you know the number of people being mutilated on a daily basis, you will, you, you will not be able to imagine the level of wickedness and evil that humanity is capable of. What people do to people. You will not leave your house for one day without God's presence. The level of wickedness, the level of cruelty, the level of marginalization. You will need the shield of God's presence over your life. And, and sometimes you don't even talk about strangers. People who are married. When evil and wickedness enters the heart of another man, you will be shocked the capacity and propensity of wickedness that man is able to, to, to pour on the other person. And so you need the insurance of God's presence in your life every day. Man is wicked. The earth is wicked. The Bible said the earth is the habitation. The dark places of the earth is the habitation of cruelty. The Bible said darkness is upon the earth and gross darkness the people. You can't afford to live a normal life. No, you need the presence of God. Number five, the presence brings joy. Psalm 16 verse 11, it said, that will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy and at thy right hand pleasures forevermore. Joy is not happiness. Happiness is external. Happiness is circumstance activated. Joy is in the spirit. And joy is strength. Joy is stability. Joy is a state of impregnability. So when you find a man who is full of joy, yes, he will be happy. But over and above that happiness, he has stability. He's impregnable. 
there is a strength in him that you can't break. So men who have joy are men you cannot break. No matter the circumstance, they will stand their ground. And because they are able to stand, they can weather the storm. That level of capacity, it's in the presence is conferred. The reason many people easily become victims is because they don't have joy. The moment their joy is stolen, they become confused. They start making mistakes. All their calculations are wrong. And they discover they fall into different level of degradation from, you know, from grass, grace to grass because joy is not there. But find a man that has joy. Even when he's in the pit, he's stable. And not too long, he will come out of that pit. So when God furnishes joy, he's giving you a system of invincibility that nothing on earth can throw you off balance. That kind of strength is in God's presence. When you, see, when you find believers who are always positive, moving forward, it's not because all is well all the time. But because of that joy, they make all things well. And the things that are not well, give them time. They will make those things well. Because when that strength is there, anything is possible. But that kind of strength is the presence that confesses it. Number six. The presence of God is the realm of his government. If you walk into God's presence, there are many things that you may not even know you need to pray for that will be handled for you. The reason things work for many persons is because they live in God's presence. Zechariah the high priest had a filthy garment but by mercy he stayed in God's presence and legislations were passed in his favor and they said let the filthy garment be removed. That's why even when we are defeated we don't run from God, we run to God. Because in God's presence, there are many things happening. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 to 24, it says, Here I come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to an innumerable company of angels, to the spirit of just men made perfect, to God, the judge of all, to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. So there are many things happening in God's presence to your advantage. There are certain battles in your life that you need angels to fight. Your doctrine can't handle it. Your revelation can't handle it. But when you have to be in God's presence for the angels to walk. So when a man lives in God's presence, some of his battles are being fought on his account. He's not even aware of it. There are certain things happening around you that you need a verdict from the throne room. There are certain things happening around you that you need the blood to speak for you. It is in the presence that all these technologies are activated. So truly, truly speaking, what makes a believer invincible is his ability to stand in God's presence. I know I don't have money yet. But there are speakings beyond my capacity that is going on in the presence that will cause some kind of favor to open things for me. I know men are ganging up against me and I don't know what I can do to fight back because truly they are bigger than me but I know I'm in God's presence. And because I'm in God's presence, who knows? A cherubim can just come out in my favor. That's where we win. We win from God's presence. Because we were created to live in God's presence. That means our greatest advantage is in God's presence. No matter how strong a shark is, a shark cannot fight a cat outside the water. Because the advantage of the shark is in the water. As small as a cat is, a cat will butcher a shark if you bring them to land. But if you change the environment and move the shark and the cat into the water, the cat, the shark will, will scatter the cat in seconds. So you are vulnerable outside of your natural habitat. And your natural habitat is God's presence. Because in God's presence, too many things are working for you. When a shark is in water, the water helps it to navigate. When the shark is in water, it picks up its oxygen from the water. When the shark is in water, it's ventilated by the water. Many things happening at the same time. That's how you become when you start living in God's presence. Things that are deeper than your knowledge will be working in your favor. You will not know how favor will come to you. You will not know how breakthrough will come. You will not know how speed will come. Everything is just insisting that you are put in advantage. And so when a believer does not content to stay in God's presence, that believer is putting his or herself in the place of gross disadvantage. And finally, 
the presence of God is a place where transfiguration takes place. Transfiguration is glorification. Everything in you that fights you is removed in the presence. What transfiguration does is that it changes your state to become exactly like God. Your enemies are not only without. There are certain things in you that fight your progress. There are some persons, they don't have the energy for destiny. Say there is an exam tomorrow, read. They will sleep the two seconds to the exam. They will now stand up and say, God help me, God help me. They are enemies then. You help them create an opening. Come to this place, take this, let this work for you. They come there one hour later. Give them access to the president. Two days later, they will scatter it. Because the things that destroy them are planted into them. And so what transfiguration does is that it edits you to remove everything that is a disadvantage that is within you. Listen, you can't fight yourself. That's why sometimes you weep, you regret, but you can't help yourself. You'll find some young people, they sleep for 12 hours every day. They can't just stand up from the bed. They roll here, they roll there, they carry their pillow, they drop the pillow. Oh God, in this first word, flog them out of that bed, tomorrow they are still there. The bed has become a grave. And then you ask them, how old are you? I'm 40. No, you are not 40. You slept for 20 years. <laughs> Who told you you are 40? And that does not include the naps they take. It does not include the two hours of gossip. It does not include the many other hours they wasted. That's why they think like 15 years old at 40. A 40-year-old person is talking. It's like 15 years old. Because he didn't put enough man, man hour to invest in himself. That energy is not there. So the demons don't need to waste their resources on that person. They say, leave him. Sleep has already changed him. You will need transfiguration for your human weaknesses and tendencies to be removed. So what the presence does is that it keeps improving you until your best version manifests. Because the things you will envision, it is your best version that will deliver them. You are seeing yourself as a leader. You are seeing yourself as a president. You are seeing yourself as a billionaire. This version of you, even if they give you the money, you waste it. There are certain things that your best version only can command. And so what transfiguration does is that it keeps bringing you up, upgrading you to your best version. So that even the things you are not praying for will come to you. See, there's a realm of you, there's a version of you that manifests that even the monies you are not asking for will come to you. There are many people today, they are not seeking contracts. They take business proposals to them and say, we want to do this thing. We just want you to be part of it. All they need to do is just to put their credibility on it. And money will be coming to them. They are not laboring. Their name is just part of the organization. Because of the version of them that has manifested. That level of improvement only the presence makes it happen. It's called transfiguration. When you are transfigured, you become a glorified being. At that level, you will literally become like God's rep to humankind. Everything God wants to do, he sends you there. I heard the story of Benson Idahusa. He said, which is bragged that they will have a meeting. And he said, the meeting will not hold. And they say, even if you tell, pray to God, we will hold the meeting. He said, I don't need to pray to God. Because I'm here, it won't happen. That is not boldness. That is transfiguration. Because there is a level you get to when you stand. It's like God is the one standing. That's what Paul meant when he said, be a followers of me. Even as I'm a follower of Christ. When a man contends for the presence of God, he is contending for the best version of himself. And that's when you become the fullness of God. That's when the ministry 
of the fullness is actualized in your life. This your version is too dominated by your humanity. There's too much anger. And so you can't handle power. Too much mistakes. They tell you to write a document. A document of five pages. There are 30 mistakes. Too much miscalculations. And so God needs to upgrade you. God needs to glorify you. And so when you are wooed into God's presence, is to bring out your best. That best of you is the glory dimension of you. When that happens, you are transfigured. And that technology is only in the presence that it takes place. We are out of time. Let's just bow our heads and pray. I would have shown you four ways of accessing the presence. Hallelujah. 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 way to come into God's presence is by blood. I will keep it very short just to mention it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you know, part of Dr. Andy's ministry to me is to encourage me and build me up. <laughs> and so I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. That's why you have fathers. <laughs> Can we celebrate our father? <laughs> Full of love. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So the first way to access God's presence is by blood. When you are coming before a spirit, there are two things he looks for, looks out for. Either perfection or atonement, restitution. If you don't have perfection, then you have to bring, present blood that is either innocent or perfect. And so the reason the doorway of the presence became open to us was because in Christ Jesus, his blood was presented for us. So the Bible said in Romans chapter 4 verse 25 that he was delivered for our offense. So his blood spoke on our account in the courts of heaven. And so Romans 5 1 said, Being freely justified by faith, we have peace with God. But what the blood of Jesus did was to make the presence accessible. Because when the door opened, not everybody entered. The door is open, and it means everybody now can live there. But not everybody is living there. Because, like I showed you already, when you are in God's presence, Transformation is natural because the presence brings God's will over yours. It superimposes God's will over yours. So the blood of Jesus opens us up and grants us access to God's presence. Now that we can access God's presence freely, it's our choice to either come in or to even live there forever and ever. Because there are those who come in and there are those who live there. And the way you see it is by the seven signs I gave you. These seven indications. They are the proofs that a man is walking in the presence. And so the first way to come into God's presence is to be born again. When you are born again, the blood of Jesus makes that door open and makes it accessible to you. But now that you are born again, there are other technologies of keeping you in God's presence. And so the second way to keep the presence of God is by the Rema word. The word of God, the proceeding word of God carries the presence of God. It's like a capsule of the presence. The Bible said in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 that in the cool of the day, the voice of God came walking in the garden. And see what it says. That voice of God brought God's presence. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. Let's look at that quickly. It said now the word of the Lord came walking 
And they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, he didn't say they hid themselves from the voice of God. He said they hid themselves from the presence of God. And so every time the voice of God comes to you, the presence of God comes to you. In Jonah chapter 1, from verse 1 to 3, he said, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah and God told him to go and raise a lamentation against the people of Nineveh. And Jonah went out of God's presence on his way to Tarshish. He didn't say Jonah went out of God's voice. He said Jonah went out of God's presence. So if you want to keep God's presence, the Rema word must always be active in your life. That's why Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every Rema that proceeds from the mouth of God. So men that have high traffic of the voice of God are men that are always under God's presence. If you want to know if God's presence is no longer with you, you will know it through the scarcity of God's voice. When God's voice becomes scarce, it means the presence of God is scarce. And so if you want to live under the presence of God, you must deploy a spiritual technology that makes the voice of God available to you. And there are not too many things that makes the voice of God available. The first thing that makes a voice, the voice of God available to a man is when that man yields himself to the world. You may not have known the voice yet, but the Bible says, give, you give. The Bible said, despise not the assembly of us with ourselves. You are ad ardent in coming to God's presence. Every instruction you see from scripture, you begin to obey it. God knows your heart is right. And because you have shown that the voice of God is law over you, gradually the rhema will begin to come. So even the ones you've not searched from scripture will begin to find you. And as the rhema begins to come to you, you will discover that there will be a cloud of God's presence around you. A man who carries God's presence carries God's voice. Because with God's voice is God's presence. When believers are having the drought of God's presence, just know that the voice of God is cast. And if you speak to them, you will know their lives are full of assumptions, presuppositions, guessworks. There is no specificity because the voice has become scarce. You want to grow in God's presence? You have to incubate yourself to carry God's word because God's voice comes with God's presence. The third thing that engenders God's presence is thanksgiving. You know, when you discuss some of these powerful spiritual truths, people are assuming to hear many mysteries. No. The biggest things in the spirit are the simplest things. That's why nobody is with, has the right for excuse. The biggest things are the simplest things. You want God's presence, you must become a, a man of thanksgiving. In Psalm 100 verse 2, Hear what the Bible says. You come into his presence with praise. Why do you think the church is usually most charged when we are praising and worshiping God? Because that's the easiest way to access God's presence. When a man makes thanksgiving, praise, worship his lifestyle, that man carries a canopy. Possibilities he commands will be too bogus for his own mind to imagine. He will call it fraud if he contemplates it. Psalm 95, verse 2. Hear what the Bible says. It says, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. It says, let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Why do you think people like David were almost invincible? He knew this secret so much. He sang his way through life. Some of us can pray in capital letter tongues, but never praise God. Every second you see us, we carry a frown because the presence of God is heavy on our lives. <laughs> and we are walking like, like... That is a yoke of flesh. Take it off. You are dying. You will grow old at 35. You are dying. Don't sniff life out of you. It's parasitism. Creating impression. 
the presence of God is not commanded by a frown. Rather, a frown will eject it off you. There are times when God can be heavy on you. That's true. There are times when God comes because there are different flavors to God's presence. But to sustain a default mode of <laughs> you are not Jeremiah, sir. <laughs> Even the wailing prophet smiles. You want to know a man who knows God's presence. His hands are always lifted. Songs are always in his spirit. He's driving, he's singing. He's entering the house, he's singing. He's entering the bathroom, he's singing. Even while he's yet bathing, as he's pouring water, he's singing. So river flow, river flow. Let it turn all river flow. In your church, once again. Let it turn it be seen. He's wearing his clothes. Elohim Adonai. Ah, 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 Elohim. Elohim Adonai. Ah, 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 Elohim. He finishes talking to the gate man and as he's driving. Baratara ekele. Omema baratara ekele. Izuru kene. As he's finishing that one, he enters another one. I have a very big God who is always by my side. A very big God who by my side is a river. It's a river. Because songs and praises, they are rivers in the spirit. That's why he said, out of their bellies shall flow rivers of living water. He said there is a, 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 a river from the throne of God. He said the streams make it glad. He make it glad the city of God. You cannot but sing. He said, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourself in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. You can't be full of God's presence and, and, and your mouth is locked. No, you can't. You will burst. The energy is too much. You will explode. And so in order not to explode, you will break forth with singing. You will break forth with dancing. You will break forth with praise. You are God. You are not just big. Oh. You are not just large. Oh. You are the great God. You are God. You are God. You are not just big. Oh. You are not just large. You. you are the great God. You are God. You are God. You are not just me. You are not just me. You are not just large. You are not just large. You are the great God. You are the great God. is not prayer. It's worship. The Bible said the 20 and 4 elders day and night they sang holy, holy, holy is the Lord. When you do this, 
Sometimes it becomes difficult to stop because the gushers begin to enlarge. You are trying to stop, you can't. You carry your clothes, you want to wash. The thing is flowing. You are, you are talking to somebody, it's flowing. You just lock yourself indoors and you saturate everywhere. As you think you are about to stop, be is not working. The promotion is not coming. The growth is not going. The pain is not living. Go shut your door. Shut the door. Wear a singlet. Wear a boxer and enter a press galore. Enter a press galore. Lift it up. Say, be Oh, no. 
of your life. My God, there's been a shift, a shift. You have just shifted. I decree that shift now. It comes now. They told you that growth is cancer. We decree that the growth vanish now. They told you you must be operated. We cancel that operation now. They told you that matter is hopeless. We restore hope in the name of Jesus. They told you it's a, it's a forgotten matter. He said that power shall raise the dead back to life. We decree the resurrection power. It comes upon you now. And hear the word of the Lord. Arise, shine. Your light has come. The glory of the Lord is lifted upon you. Your business blossoms. Your family blossoms. Your jobs blossom. Everything you lay your hands to do in righteousness is commanded to prosper. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Can you pray in the Holy Ghost for one minute? Something is shifting here. Can you pray in the Holy Ghost? They say over their dead body, bodies before you marry, we decree you marry now. Everyone that says, until they die, you will not prosper. We permit them to die. In the name of Jesus, your prosperity is now. Your prosperity is now. Come on. 
He will shout. Somebody shout. Somebody shout. If you love my Jesus, he will scream. Higher, 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 higher. Oh. Jesus. Somebody clap, clap. If you love my Jesus, some scream up. Jesus. Somebody jump, jump. Somebody jump, jump. Somebody jump, jump. If you love my Jesus, scream on. you were blessed by this message you just listened to and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat the prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son Jesus Christ and that he died for my sins and was raised from the dead for my justification. I therefore confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just said this prayer, please send us an email at info at encounterjesusministry.org or info.ejmi.ng at gmail.com. You can also visit our website at www.encounterjesusministry.org.